Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Christmas to everybody here. Um, I'm so thrilled about um, this Christmas season and, and the uh, series that we're jumping into. And it's I'll Be Home for Christmas. It's about family. It's about the family of God. And um, we're going to have an awesome opportunity on Christmas Eve. Three services. We had so many people last year. We had to add another service. It's going to be incredible. It's okay. It's okay. Nothing's going to get you. <laughs> so if you had to turn to like when they heard the steam, it's the building warming up, hopefully. Hopefully she'll be kind to us. Um, But this Christmas Eve is going to be an incredible opportunity to bring the community in. We're actually going to be having a festival going on uh, around the building. Some really great things for family and kids. And we're actually giving out tickets next week that you can invite neighbors and friends. Um, So uh, get ready for those. Uh, If people bring them, there's kind of some fun games and things that they can do with them. And uh, if they turn them in, they get an opportunity at getting a prize. It's going to be a blast. I just want to uh, let you guys know I'm so excited about it. I love you guys. So glad you're here. You made it to church. Well done. It's a busy season, and I hope that you're blessed for it. Let's pray and get started. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We're so grateful that we get to be here together. I pray just for this church, this group of people. Lord, no matter where they're at in their faith, no matter, no matter where they're at in their life, would you bless them? Would you speak to them? Would you give them your truth? And Lord, would they find your love and acceptance in an extra measure today? Encourage those who are broken and weary and disappointed. Give them encouragement. Give them life today. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I was walking, there's a back hall that we have for kind of staff and getting things ready and I was walking back there and my, my wife opened the door and walked back and it was just us two. She had this walk and I was like, woman, did you come back here to make out with me? And uh, it was like literally just between services and she was like, no, I came to do communion. And I was like, you righteous woman, you righteous woman. <laughs> she is, she is. I'm not going to lie, I was a little disappointed, but... Um, <laughs> I wanted to start off just by recognizing something that's real in our community this, uh, this week. And uh, there was a tragedy this weekend. There was a, a police officer in the Tacoma Police Department that was shot. And I just want um, to read this, that our church, our prayers and our heart are with the friends and family of the fallen Tacoma Police Officer, Jake Gutierrez, as well as the men and the women of Tacoma Police Department. Um, and this happened in our own backyard. Um, and you might have family or friends that are public servants or police officers, and um, every day they're facing crisis, they're facing danger, and we just appreciate them and love them, and we're, we're um, hurting with you. Our hearts are aching with those friends and family and people connected to it, and it's scary stuff that we live in a world that has real darkness and brokenness, right? Like, then there's no guarantee um, of safety or guarantee of, of the perfect life that we want. There's this verse in Romans uh, that it says this, Romans 12, 21, it says, do not be overcome by evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And we live in this world where I think in the news, when you look at it, when you look at um, uh, just maybe even with a critical eye, there can kind of be, become a criticalness in our own hearts and a jaded 
um, a jaded aspect of our lives where we just look out at the world and we look at the news and it just looks like evil's overcoming good all the time. You look globally, you look you know, internationally, you look nationally in our own nation, you look at all the issues and divisions, it can just look like that evil and wrong and darkness is overcoming good all the time. But, but the word of God teaches us something amazing about God. And it teaches us this, that we aren't to be overcome by evil. We are to be the ones, the, the church, the community that, that overcomes evil with good. Are you with me? Because we live in a time where people need to see good overcoming evil with good. Not trying to overcome evil with more evil, with hate for hate, anger for anger, lies for lies. Good over evil. And um, I think there's been a lot of good overcoming evil in our world, if you really look for it. Um, When you look at God, he sent his son to absorb all the evil, all the wrong, all the um, deceptiveness, all the darkness that the world could throw at him. And he overcame it through the cross and poured out forgiveness and love. He overcame evil with good. That's the God we serve. In fact, that's the, that's the, the cosmic divine conspiracy going on in God's, uh, work and in God's uh, economy he is overcoming evil with good that's just how he works and there's been a lot of good going on we just threw a big party for foster care kids we had uh, over 400 kids we had 700 with families included it was unreal and guys good was overcoming in those situations Uh, I want to show you a few pictures of some of the good that was happening. I mean, it was unbelievable. Just there were gifts that were given. Let's show that. Like we had gifts. I'm telling you, I had these like 400 kids and we all gave, they had gifts in their hands at the end of this thing. And we were like, okay, don't open them yet. You got to wait till the countdown. Don't open them. Actually, let's, maybe let's just not open them today. And the kids are like, no, you know, with anticipation, they could barely even handle it. And we did this countdown, you know, five, four, three, two, one. And then boom, all these wrapping papers and explosions and parents were falling over by the power of these kids opening these gifts I mean just look at that there was just joy in the place guys good was overcoming evil go to the next picture um you guys we serve so many people and smiles like this were all over the place I mean it was just coming from the heart it was unbelievable who we got to serve and the joy that was there. You go to the next, I love the pirate hat too, that was awesome. And then we had Santa, I mean, there was a line just going around the block for Santa. We, uh, we, had, we even had Blackbeard, the pirate, because it was an undersea, oversea, mermaids, pirates kind of themed party. And, uh, and it was Christmas, and this, there was just joy and wonder. I mean, there were kids that were just looking at Santa, looking at, you know, the pirates, and then we had princesses that were there they, they could get pictures with, and they were just like in awe. Oh, they didn't know if they had died and gone to heaven, you guys. It was unbelievable. And that's the next picture. Um, and that just says it all, doesn't it? That just says it all. It was, there was so much joy. Um, thank you for being involved, whether bringing gifts or praying or serving at the event. And I, guys, good was overcoming evil. We had men like gritty, a little smelly, um, men's men. I mean, just unshaven uncouth beasts who had put together a big shark a big a big shark mouth so as people came into the building the shark had a like its maw its jaws were moving up and down they had built it so it could do that and you had to walk through and their kids are like no way went running in parents they're like this is incredible jumping in there were a few kids that were like uh-uh 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 you know and then we had a we had a snow sled it was like six feet high and kids were just flying out this thing in these in gruff men We're like gently and tender, with tender hearts, just helping these kids up and loving the families and kids. It was so wonderful. And then they were just shooting them down that thing. Whoa! They would just fly out of that uh, that slide. It was unbelievable. The event was incredible. But there's a lot of good overcoming evil. And we got to bless families who've opened their hearts and their homes to kids who are coming from um, backgrounds of uh, addiction or where their families are struggling with verbal and physical abuse even just hurt and harm and hardship and they've opened their homes so that these kids could have a home 
And we were blessing families who after the service were in tears because they felt, they felt loved. And these people are overcoming evil with good by opening their homes. Guys, God's kingdom is at work. We need to know it. We need to believe it. I had a, a knock on the door on Friday. And it was like a hefty knock, like boom, 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 boom. I thought it was a dude. I go open the door. I'm like, oh, Maggie. And not Maggie Myers. Not Maggie. Some of you guys might know her. Uh, she could probably knock even harder. She's strong. Um, but this Maggie was a neighbor from like two or three years ago. I hadn't seen her in forever. She's like, hey, I don't know if you saw the text. And I was like, no, I didn't see a text. She's like, I, Sarah said it was okay. Um, we saw the video for this one child project you guys are doing. We saw Jack's video. You guys remember that video from the last few weeks? And it tells the story, a real story of what happens to foster care kids. And often, like, they come from such a hard background, some of them never having Christmas before. And she goes, I had to get my four-year-old, five-year-old daughter to come see it. She'd never seen a story like that where seen families that don't have or split like this. And she's like, we watched it together and our hearts were breaking. My daughter's like, why is this happening? My daughter didn't even understand it at first. And when I explained it to her, her heart was broke. My heart was broke. And she's like tearing up like on my doorstep. I haven't seen her in two or three years. And she's like, and we just had to be part of it. So we got a game. Could, could you guys use a board game? We saw that you guys were accepting those. I'm like, absolutely. She's like, thank you. And then she ran off. I had a neighbor from two or three years ago knocking down my door to be a part of the movement of God. And I, we live in a, uh, at a time in an era when religion and spirituality seems so like, it's passe, it's like this is in the past and it's, you know, it's about rules and regulations or they've had some kind of bad experience with it or it's self-centered and it's not about anybody else and Christians don't care about the world, they just care about themselves and, you know, you see like these ridiculous pastors on TV sometimes like raising money to get a jet, you know, and I'm like, you don't need a jet, all you need is a helicopter, that's all we're trying to do. You know. <laughs> But just like, and, it, and, it, and, and there's some, I think, I think it's small and few and far between because most of the leaders and Christians that I know have big hearts and they love God. But there's an impression in the world that spirituality and religion is so like, it's maybe even worthless. And that kind of religion is worthless. It's worthless to God. He says, that's not true religion. True religion is taking care of widows and orphans. True religion is practicing what you preach. True religion is having my heart for the community. And friends, we serve a God whose movement, the spirituality, the religion of, of the true God is the kind that gets neighbors you haven't seen in three years knocking on your door saying, how can I be a part of this? Isn't this true? Isn't this what we want to be a part of? So what I want to talk to you guys today is about the family of God, about the family of God. I mean, when my neighbor came, she's like, my daughter couldn't believe that there were families that had been through so much hardship compared to her. It was just outside of her thinking. And there's this verse in 1 John that says this, it's unbelievable. It says, see how very much our Father loves us. See how very much our Father loves us. This is talking about God the Father. For he calls us his children and that is what we are. He calls us his children and that is what we are. I I love that for a few reasons. But the big one is like if if you believe in God, if you've put your faith and put your trust in him, you're in his family. God calls you his child. Even if it's like a little inkling of faith, if it's like a weak faith, it's like I'm not so sure about this and I've got my doubts or, you know, sometimes I live for him, sometimes I don't. Even when you're being, can I say a total dork, a total, you know, just wasting your life, but you've put your faith in Christ, he, you're his kid, and he loves you. Like, you're in his family. This is the family, and it's a good family. It's a warm family. It's a family that, like, loves and has compassion and generosity. I had a friend say, we can never forget this about Whitewater. I was asking questions of some leaders. I was saying, what makes Whitewater Whitewater? Like, what makes our church? And we were like, we worship. We want to have great worship, and we want to teach the word, and we want to have... Um, you know, great events that really bless people. We want to bless the world. And he was like, I love, that is why we're, he's like, but we can never forget this. We can never forget that we're a family. We're a family. As my friend grew up without a lot of family. He's like, we're a family. I found a family here. As the people, people need the family of God. The family of God really is the hope of the world. If we looked at Acts chapter 2, I want to answer this question. What does the family of God look like? What does it look like? 
Acts chapter two, I think, paints a vivid, incredible vision of what the family of God looks like, the church. If you guys have your Bibles or your notes, you can open them, you can follow along uh, on the screen behind me. But it says this, starting in verse 36, Peter, um, one of Jesus' disciples, one of his leaders, is preaching this incredible sermon to all these people who don't yet know Jesus. And he says, so let everyone know in Israel and know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. Remember that, that man, Jesus, that did all those incredible things that you rejected, that you said, uh-uh, I don't want to follow him, and then you, you killed him, you put him on a cross? That guy was raised from the dead. That guy was God's son. It was God's gift to you, and you, and you killed him. You rejected him. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him, and to the other apostles, the other leaders, brothers, what should we do? Like, we missed it. We ruined it. We rejected it. We, I can't believe I missed it. Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins, turn from your sins, turn away from, and turn to God. Turn away from all your regrets. Turn away from all your mistakes. Turn away from even the regrets you don't even know you should regret. All the, all the wickedness in the heart and darkness in your heart, turn from it and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Like go public with your faith for the forgiveness of your sins and then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's like all these cool things are given to those who trust in God and say, hey, you're gonna be my father. I'm gonna be in your family. This promise is to you and to your children and to those far away and all who have, been, who have called um, being called by the Lord our God. This, this extends to you and me, like Peter's even talking about you and me, like people who were present in his, when he was preaching, he's like, people who are far away geographically, people who are far away like through history, anybody who calls on the name of God enters the family of God. Anybody who calls on the name of God and repents and turns to him will be forgiven. They'll have the Holy Spirit. And when you're baptized, it's going public with your faith. It's saying like, I, I'm part of the family. I, I'm, I'm on his team. And next week, I want to let you guys know, like, one of the things the family of God does, we baptize people to show that you're in his family, and there's something so special about it. Jesus was baptized to give an example for us, to be baptized, to show that our hearts are changed. And if you've been wanting to get baptized, you've been thinking about it, like, there's no better time. Next week, we're doing baptisms. We, I love Baptism Sunday. It's, it's the sign of change of the human heart. And if you want to get baptized, mark it on your connection card today. Um, you'll get a call this week or show up ready to get baptized. We'll, we even have clothes for you if you need it. Like, we, we're serious about this. It's going to be so great. Invite your family and friends. Mark the connection card. Come. It's going to be incredible. Now, the picture of the church gets really specific from here on out. So I want to read this. This is a picture of the passion of the family of God. And it says in verse 42, all the believers, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. All of them did. And to fellowship and with sharing in meals and, and to prayer. Verse 43, a deep sense of awe came over them all and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders in the midst of ordinary people like you and me. God was doing extraordinary things. Verse 44 says, and all the believers met together, many miraculous signs, uh, excuse me, met together in one place and shared everything they had. They shared everything. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money, uh, the money they had with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper, which is our communion. It's when we take the, uh, the wine or the grape juice and, and bread or crackers. It's, it's the things we consume to remind us of our need of God's forgiveness and his love. Um, and so they took the Lord's Supper together and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. And all the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, get this, don't miss it. Each day the Lord added to their, to their number, or their fellowship, those who were being saved. If we backed up a little bit in the passage we were in in Acts 2, if we looked at verse 40, it says, Peter continued preaching for a long time. If you know the Bible says he preached for a long time, it was a long time. <laughs> Urging his listeners, save yourselves from this wicked or crooked generation where everyone's doing their own thing, but never God's thing. Save yourself from that. And in verse 41, those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added in number to the church that day, about 3,000 in all. Like the church was exploding. There once was this group of people that had such 
devotion to God, such faith in him, such a fire in their hearts about him that, that they became a people where like people were loved, uh, compassion flowed from their hearts, generosity flowed out and helped people and met needs. Like there was this, once this church that was, had such incredible faith that it, it like shook the foundations of the Roman Empire. It changed the world. They had 300, 3,000 people come to Christ and be baptized in one day. And that was just one day. They were having people being added to their number daily because God changes human lives in real human history in real time. How many of you guys have had God change your life? Let me ask you this about the family of God, about the church. How many of you guys have had a, ch- a church play a major role in changing your life? It's unbelievable. What would we do without God's family? I mean, sometimes it gets a bad reputation, but the church I know, Jesus' church changes lives. How many of you guys have your life in some way, you've made a major decision in your life at Whitewater Church, this church? Raise your hand if you've made a major decision here. God is moving. What would we do without our community? I mean, let me, let me read this. What are the components? What are the components of a church that acts like an Acts 2 church, like an Acts chapter 2 church, a family of God? As this, this vision we're talking about of the church has gripped my heart. Like, like I don't want to do anything else. I just want to give everything I have to seeing a church be like this church where miracles are happening, where life is happening. So what are the components that make up this church, this vision that God gives us? Well, <clears throat> if we start in verse 42, there's, a, there's some important things. You can fill this out in your notes. There's some, um, some blank lines that you can fill this out on. But it says, all the believers devoted themselves. Underline that in your scripture. It says devoted themselves. Fully in. Fully devoted. Hearts on fire. Willing to give everything. It says fully devoted to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, sharing meals, and to prayer. They devoted themselves to God and to each other. Not like a half-hearted, like I'm kind of in. Isn't that horrible if you're in like a relationship with somebody and they're like kind of in? Yeah, I might meet you there. I might show up. Yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry you're going through that. Like I wish I could be there and, and, and comfort you. Like you could be here. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not going to be able to. Like that's horrible. You know, have ever been in a real relationship that's heading toward marriage or something? You find out they're like kind of in. These are fully devoted people. Their whole hearts. A deep sense of awe, it says, came over them and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. The first part of that, there, there was a deep sense of awe. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you were completely blown away by God? Like fully in awe of how powerful and incredible and wonderful and loving God is. When was the last time you, not your husband, not someone, you, when I'm in awe, when like I'm totally blown away by God, when I see like a sunset and, or I see Rainier and, a, and at one of those moments, I'm just like, wow, God, you created this. I get like chills that go down my spine, down my arms. I get, sometimes I'll even get teary. I, I probably shouldn't even admit that, but I'll get like teary when I'm, I'm blown away. When was the last time you were blown away by something? Just like, whoa. If you're not a Christian and you're like, you've never thought about God like that, when was the last time you were actually in awe of something? Just like the overwhelmed, like, oh, can't explain it. You're not trying to break it down. You're not trying to put it under a microscope. You're just like, wow, that exists. That's there. And I want to tell you, there's nothing more powerful that will put all into your heart, that will blow your mind than our God, his love. His joy, his peace, his goodness. There's nothing better. And then it says there's miraculous signs and wonders that happen. In the family of God, when, when we are devoted to him, God's moving in ways that we can't ever even explain. Um, we've, we've had miracles in our, in our church. We've had, we've had people, like we've had families that couldn't have kids. Doctors said, you will not be able to have children. Have children. Like, that's pretty cool, Right? I want to be part of that kind of community. We had a guy named Paul Kwan, a really great leader. He was a pastor, and then he came here uh, after he had really bad cancer. He wasn't even supposed to survive that. And then he actually was made well again, and now he's pastoring again. Um, 
There was a, a season where he went into the doctor and they found masses in his cheeks. And they're like, you're gonna have to come back, but the, it looks like the cancer's back. And next week, come back. And between when he found that out from the doctor and he was gonna come back to have some more pictures taken of it and come up with a game plan, um, he came to church and asked us to pray. And my friend Ty and some other leaders at Whitewater, we prayed for him. And he went to the doctor that, that next week and he took a picture of it and there was nothing. Couldn't find anything, couldn't explain it. I can't explain it, I'm just telling you. Like this happens in the community of God and his family. Let's keep going. What other things happen? What other components happen? Miracles happen. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They, they had sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. There's radical compassion, radical generosity. It costs us something to meet a need, doesn't it? But in, in the family of God, in an Acts chapter two church, like someone needs a car, like somehow a car has gotten for somebody. If someone needs some money, if someone needs groceries, if someone needs a bill to be paid, like, like the church takes care of it, friends. And we are, we're called to be a church that trusts that God, he's our provider. You know, I don't know how it's gonna happen, but he'll provide. It doesn't mean we don't work. It doesn't mean we don't like, we just sit around doing nothing. No, we work hard and we try to provide for our families, but there are things beyond our control at times, are there not? And the church is meant to be the body of Christ meeting those needs and takes compassion and generosity. Verse 40, 46, let's keep moving. They worship together at the temple each day, a family of God that is devoted to him in Acts chapter two church has incredible worship. And not just singing, but like focusing our hearts on God. I think it has something to do with that awe, that being blown away, like wow, God, you're incredible. And thanking him and praising him and you're incredible. Like a church that is devoted to God praises him and worships him. They met in homes for the Lord's supper, it says, and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. Like it's a community that wants to be together, a community that's generous toward each other, and, and not only financially, yes, financially, but genero- generous like in our kindness toward each other. Do you know like, they're, like people in this room are filled with like foibles and idiosyncrasies and weirdness? How many of you guys know, have you guys loved you know, like your family? There's weird family, right? You got weird uncles, you got weird aunts, maybe you got a weird mom or dad, maybe you're, maybe you're weird. You know, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, my dad has some, he, I mean, I love my dad. He has some idios, idiosyncrasies that are, are really funny. Like one of them I came across recently when Sarah's family joined our family and they got to know my dad. My dad has like this gallows humor, this dark humor where he likes to laugh at things that like you probably shouldn't laugh at. Um, but he thinks like, uh, is he's been around death so long being a pastor, doing funerals and stuff like that, that he will actually find humor in the worst of places. So like he has books that he likes to read, like the, the, the 40 worst deaths in Yellowstone. You know, and be like, he'll be like, guys, check this out. My, my in-laws are over and he's like, there's a, there's a guy who's wearing like a really colorful vest and he came upon a grizzly bear and he, you know, he's like one of those real beatnik guys and, and he just waved at the bear and said, hey, bear. And the bear ate him. Ha, 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 ha. You know, he's like, and like my mother-in-law is horrified. She's like, ooh, ooh. And he's like, that's horrible. And he's like, oh, it reminds me of a story when, you know, I was younger. We knew a guy who went out to the, to the woods. He went in the mountains and he fell off a cliff. And he died. Ah! And I think my, my family's like, oh. And so like he's, the, he's known as the one who laughs at death. And um, we, we're, we're such interesting people, aren't we? We have to have patience and... But we love one another and we're generous toward each other. And it says in verse 47, all the while praising God and, in, uh, and enjoying the goodwill of all the people and each day the Lord added to their number, added fellowship to uh, those who are being saved. People's lives are being changed. People's lives are being changed. My life has been changed by the vision of the church. My life has been changed. But could you imagine, I mean, a, ch- a church that is so sold out for Jesus, that they're generous, they're filled with faith, they're filled with expectation for God to move. There are miracles that you can't explain. And I know there's people like, well, the Bible, the Bible I read says that maybe there aren't miracles today. Jesus didn't believe in that. And the early church had miracles going on. I, I believe in that church, and I've seen that. And I, guys, I'm sold out on that. I don't want anything less. That's what I want for our church 
I know that God wants it more than me. He gave us a vision of it in the book of Acts. He gives us a vision of it throughout the whole New Testament that we can be a church, imperfect, yes, but we can be a family where life change happens, a family where belonging and acceptance happens, and then people become who they never thought they could be. Imagine if you took the church out of the world, the real church out of the world. What would that world look like? What would that world look like? What would the needs in the world, there's no church, there's no community of God. See, friends, Christ in us, Christ's family is the hope of the world. It's the, what, what, what else can change a human heart? What book, you know, what text besides the Bible can transform a human and take a hard heart and make it soft again? What God is there in, amongst his people where he can provide generously the needs that we have? There's no other place. I mean, there's no other more powerful force in the world than Christ's church, his family. His family is the hope of the world. Are you with me on this? This is what we're called to be. We were at the one child party, um, actually the, the night before, and we're getting all these, wrapping all these gifts. And some of you guys come to that, like it was, we had people just work so hard and wrap these gifts. And, but we were getting like families signed up late like way past the deadline. And they're like, I don't know what to do. We had like, we have a family of seven and we have another family of six and there's something, we don't have gifts for them. And you know, and we just told them, look at the deadline was the deadline. Just tell them they can't come. No, are you kidding me? <laughs> Some of you guys are like, seriously? You could have called me, I would have bought a gift. No, of course we wouldn't do that, right? Because we're the church. Like the whole purpose of the church, the whole reason we exist is to help others experience God and find him and and have a transformed life. We make disciples. God added to their number those who are being changed daily. We should expect people to have their lives changed. We should expect to bring friends and family and neighbors and people into the family of God and have them transformed. In fact, in the book of John, uh, uh, chapter four, it says this in verse 35. But I say, says Jesus, I say, wake up. He says this to his disciples, and I think he would say it to you and me. Wake up, look around you, open your eyes. The fields are already ripe for harvest. It's time. What's the harvest? Well, the harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is what? What is it, friends? It's people brought to eternal life. It's people brought to eternal life. It's people who are healed. It's people who are changed. And I would say it like this. We as a church, our main purpose, friends, the thing that brings most glory to God, the thing that praises him and brings his heart most joy is when we bring broken people into the greatness of God. It's on your notes. I want you to write it on your heart. We are the church when we bring broken people into the greatness of God, experience his love, experience his his healing, experience his forgiveness. They're given the Holy Spirit. They're given a community that lives and loves them and lives with them and helps them become who they never thought they could be because when we bring broken people with all sorts of issues and all sorts of problems, and luckily we get to bring them because we get to come too then, when we bring broken people into God's greatness, they begin having a vision for his greatness and the greatness God has planned for their life. Do you want to be a part of a church like this? That's my heart. I don't want anything less. This Christmas season, people are more receptive to God than normal than the other times during the year. It's just something we've noticed. And so like, we, we want to have an incredible December. We want to have an incredible December season where we see God add to our number those who are being saved, that we bring broken people into the greatness of God. So we're going to be having like Christmas Eve, we're having three services because we don't think we can handle the, the people we're going to have in just two. We barely were able to do it last, last year. We've grown since then. And the temptation is to be like, oh, there's a line. We, 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 we can't have more people. Oh, more foster kids signed up. Nope. Are you kidding me? Like, who are we going to turn away? Who would we say no to? There's, there's empty seats here. Like, are we saying, oh, we're, we're good. This, this church we have, we're fine at this size. We're fine with, these, with this amount of people. I'm fine with my friends. I finally have my small community I feel comfortable with. And so this is it. God added to their number daily. 
Because God cares about people. Do we have a heart for people? I just want to ask you to be praying, be thinking, inviting, and, and joining us, partnering with us in reaching people this Christmas. We're going to present gospel, like opportunity for people to give their lives to Jesus and step into the greatness of God at Easter. And the, on these coming Sundays, we're going to be having baptism next Sunday. Bring your friends. Get baptized. Let's see Jesus transform our community into an Acts chapter 2 church. And I think this stuff's already going on. But could we see him transform our church even more into this? Because this is the hope of the world. Christ in us. Christ's family is the hope of the world. What's the issue? What's the problem? What would prevent churches from being like Acts chapter 2? You've experienced it. I have too. Like where there's a coldness in the church or there's a focus on, on, on us and not on the community and there's not a love for the community or they love the Bible so much that God can almost fit in it. We love our tradition so much that God can almost fit in it. We love the building so much that God's power can almost fit in it but we got so many things planned and so much stuff on our, on our plate that we just, we don't have time for that. We've all experienced that to some degree because it's a human issue. It's in, it's in our hearts to want to serve ourselves, and it can be in the church to serve itself. And so I, I think the biggest issue, the biggest preventer, the biggest barrier to having the, an Acts chapter 2 family of God where people are transformed is this. I think it's a faith issue. Do we believe that God actually did this and wants to do this? Do we believe what happened in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago can happen in Puyallup? Do you believe that God... Uh, is sending and has people he wants to send to your home to knock on the door and have you open it to say, how can I be a part of this amazing thing that is, that is changing lives? Do we believe that God has those people? Are we reaching out to them? Do we love them? Do we have faith? The other thing is, are we devoted? Are we just like kind of halfway in? Because that's a faith issue, isn't it? Like, kind of believe in God or I believe in God when I'm in trouble? Do we believe that there is a creator of the whole universe that looks at our world, that loves our world so much to send his son to die for us, take our sins away, to give us forgiveness, give us new life? Do we believe it? Do you believe that he can use you in your life where you're at and change hearts and lives? Do you believe it? When we have that vision the church becomes the unstoppable force it was designed to be. Where else can people find forgiveness? Where else can people like have their sins washed away, guilt removed from the heart, have a heart of stone transformed into a, a heart of flesh that actually beats again? Where else can, can the world go to to receive the Holy Spirit, God's spirit of love? Where else can the world go to have uh, a new vision, a new purpose for their life? There's nowhere else on heaven and on earth that we can go other than God's movement on, on and through the church. It's us, friends. It's a little scary. You're like, wow, it's happening through here? Yeah, it's the beautiful mess and God wants to use us. Are you with me? I want to read you guys something. This is from my friend. Sent this last, last night after the one child party. He said, I'm so proud to be part of a church that doesn't just teach the word of God. It lives it. The church doesn't, uh, doesn't just see a need and sympathize. We take on the challenge of meeting the need. I love our church, says my friend, and I love you guys. See, my friend found Christ in this community years ago. It became a family for him. And now he is working, doing everything he can. He I means totally sold out for Christ, totally devo devoted to Jesus. I mean, uh, opens their home, gives everything he can give so other people can experience what he experienced. So other people who, who need to be sitting in a seat like this, who need to be in a community like this, who need to be loved and have generosity poured out, out on, on them, uh, the, just as he has experienced it, he is giving that to this church and to God. I want you guys to know that like, this is real. That's right, baby. This is real. And I want to know if you're in. 
Devote yourselves to this. This is the vision God has given us. Let's be the church. Let's bring broken people into the greatness of God. Let's be the hope of the world. Amen. As we pray, I'm going to ask us to prepare our hearts for communion. You notice in that passage in Acts, it said they took the Lord's Supper, reminding themselves that when they drank the wine or the grape juice, that it, it was, it's to remind us of Christ's blood that was spilt for you and me. Then when we eat the bread or the crackers, um, which are good for anybody to have, even if you have some kind of allergy, because they're like the allergen-free kind, which is good. Uh, no gluten, those bad boys. But when you take that, you remember his body that was broken for you. So if you would, if you're a believer and you've stepped into faith, maybe today, maybe this week, maybe years ago, this is for believers, people who have decided to step into faith, to remind ourselves again that we are the church, that we are the ones that live in such a way that people pound our doors down to get in. And we make it easy for them to come in. They can belong before they believe because Christ made it easy for us to belong. He died for us. I love you guys. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to worship you, as we come to take communion today, as we come to uh, devote our hearts again and again and again to creating a church where mercy rains down and where righteousness and justice is poured down on people and on lives and on hearts that matter and on all the brokenness in the world, Lord, would you use us to be your church that changes the world? Would you use us these meager hearts, broken lives, forgetful, divided at times, distracted almost all the time. Lord, would you use us humans to breathe your hope into the world that people might know Jesus, that they might know you and be forgiven. In your name, amen.